Now, where is that darn wait person with the check? We haven't even ordered yet. Welcome to Ms. Mojo Glow, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 cringiest and just like that moments. Number 10, Brady and Louisa need separate cold showers. Remember sweet little Brady from Sex and the City? Well, he's not so sweet anymore. Now, the 17-year-old is an amalgamation of almost every awful teen character cliche the writers could think of. He's obnoxious, messy, and bratty. Stop, you're embarrassing. No, you have embarrassed yourself. To cap it all off, no one's parents want to hear their kids having sex. His girlfriend, Louisa, is no better. She acts all entitled, and she's pretty rude to Miranda and Steve, too. You know, whole milk is actually healthier than low fat, especially for aging bones. Number nine, Samantha deserved better. And where's the fourth musketeer? Where's Samantha? Oh, um, she's no longer with us. After learning that Kim Cattrall wouldn't be returning, fans were intrigued to see how the show would handle Samantha's absence. Needless to say, many of us were left unimpressed. Nothing about their explanation suited the character we know at all. Like, do we really think Samantha is so fragile as to drop all her friends because of a professional interaction? Sidebar, why would Carrie need a PR rep on retainer anyway? To add insult to injury, it often feels like they're trying to make Anthony or even Seema the new Samantha. How many dating apps are you on? How much time have you got? Number eight, justice for Steve. Look, we get it, but how is it that Steve seems to have aged so much more than everyone else? Not looks-wise, but everything else. Although, granted, his hearing loss is reflective of David Eigenberg's real-life condition. But in general, Steve's portrayed as a confused and awkward shell of his former self. I left my wallet over with a pickle guy who used to be over in that corner. While Miranda's going through a sexual awakening and struggling with addiction, he's picking chia seeds out of his teeth. That certainly doesn't sound like the witty wisecracker we remember. The writers responded to the backlash by insisting that they love Steve and his Steve-ness. Number seven, Carrie wakes up to Miranda and Shay getting it on. Fans were divided over whether or not Miranda's chemistry and subsequent affair with Che felt forced. But scenes like this weren't exactly winning them any favors. Che visits Carrie, who's recuperating from surgery. But since she's fast asleep, Che and Miranda share a bottle of tequila in the kitchen. And just like that, things get rather intimate. Tell me like it, tell me not to stop. I like it. Oh, please, Che. This scene is one long, continuous cringe fest. Whether it's Carrie catching her friend and boss going at it, or the accident she has when there's no one to help her to the bathroom. Number six, the forced introduction of new characters. The revival of Sex and the City promised to address some of the original shortcomings. In fact, Cynthia Nixon told Elle that this was why she chose to return to the series. I, I knew that you were black when I signed up for this class. Uh, that was important to me. And sure, there is more diversity on camera and among the writers, yet it lacks authenticity. Instead, the new characters feel like they exist to tick a box, making them hard to watch. Number five, Charlotte tries to diversify her circle. While planning a dinner party, Charlotte worries that cool mom Lisa Todd Wexley will be the only person of color there. Her solution? Forcibly try to befriend other people of color. Maybe you and David could pop in before your dinner for drinks, you know, just pop in, say hi. She hounds her poor neighbor and even asks Anthony to help her get in touch with one of his black friends. The insensitive faux pas don't end there either. Charlotte commits the first blunder at Herbert's birthday party by mistaking a guest for another black woman she knows. Hi, Gwen. Hi, I haven't seen you since Leo transferred to Dalton. Meanwhile, Harry overcompensates for his awkwardness by embarrassingly name-dropping black celebrities. Number four, Charlotte tells Anthony about rock. Sex and the City approached their LGBTQ plus characters through a very heteronormative lens, but now they had a second chance to get it right, or so we hoped. I don't feel like a girl. Oh. After Charlotte's younger child tries to come out, Charlotte attempts to explain what happened to Anthony. We were left completely aghast by his dismissive attitude and recoiled in horror as he essentially told Charlotte to ignore it. I'm her mother, I can't ignore it. Says who? Everyone. This could have been such a poignant moment about acceptance for Charlotte and Rock, but instead, 
we were left wide-eyed by this totally tone-deaf conversation. Number three, Miranda Hobbs, white savior. Miranda was often the forward-thinking, outspoken advocate of the group. So we guess they wanted to show that anyone can misfire when it comes to the subject of race. Did you have to say something? Oh, one of the important takeaways I got from how to be an anti-racist is if you see something, you have to speak on it. Even so, that scene from her first day in class should be locked away in some vault to save us from the secondhand embarrassment. Pro tip, don't take a shot after every microaggression because you will not make it out of the scene conscious. But even if we ignore that scene, we'd still be left with her white savior complex. Surely Miranda understands the difference between getting annoyed at a security guard who's just asking for ID and what to do when someone's getting mugged in front of you. I'm so sorry, are you okay? I, 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 I was unclear to me whether that was a white savior moment or not. Number two, did you hear that the show's woke now? As we've mentioned, Sex in the City had its problems. And, and they're vintage. Right, from a time when that was okay. And just like that was here to prove that the series could get with the times. Only it really couldn't. Like, oh, he, she, they, them, oh, please tell me which box to check! Rather than focus on a couple of social issues and really do them justice, they tried to tackle a bit of everything and fell short at almost every step. As if that isn't bad enough, much of the dialogue points at how woke the show thinks it's being. Woke moment! This was a major turnoff for many fans and had plenty of us face palming throughout. Number one, Che, just Che. Che symbolizes a lot of the show's pitfalls. Their introduction was lacking, and their entire personality is steeped in tokenism. Their awful podcast voiced the show's most combative wokeism, and it's hard to forget that stand-up special. And just because my family loves me does not mean that they're not confused. For a show that claims to be aware of the lack of representative non-binary characters in the media, and just like that does a pretty decent job of turning Che into a cringe-worthy caricature. They could have been such a positive force in Miranda's sexual awakening rather than just your host and queer non-binary Mexican-Irish diva representing everyone else outside these two boring genders. 